Hey there, folks. Welcome to another edition of Stranger in a Southern Land. I, of course, am your host, Jake Manning. Today in the program, we have Mr. Mayor himself, the mayor of Charlotte, Mr. Dan Claude Felter. I'm so excited for you guys. I'm so excited to release this. I'm so excited for myself to be releasing it, to be really quite honest. Yeah, this interview has been a long time coming. I've been coordinating with Ashley from the mayor's office for quite some time. So thank you, Ashley, for helping make this interview possible. And I must say, it's kind of a short one, but that's because the mayor is a busy man. He doesn't have time to talk to me for like 90 minutes or an hour. He's got to get stuff done so we gotta get in there do this thing and get right out but it's a wonderful conversation with the mayor and who knows maybe after the election i'll be able to talk to mr mayor again so uh anyways speaking of busy men with strong mustaches i will be a very busy man in this upcoming week Tomorrow, Tuesday, August 25th, Epic Storytellers of the Charlotte Comedy Zone. Make sure you come out for that. It's a very unique show. And I have a very unique story that I will be sharing at Epic Storytellers. And hopefully, it's epic. This Friday, August 28th, I will be performing at the Charlotte Comedy Theater. It'll be my first improv show, along with some other very funny people and wonderful people who are doing improv. It is a student show. Uh, a lot of people will be first-time improv sh- performers so i'm very excited about that i've been doing a lot of stand-up but this will be my first time performing improv it'll be at the nc music factory in the back of what willies that'll be this friday august 28th then august 29th on saturday i'll be wrestling for aml wrestling in high point north carolina more information on that on their website so make sure you check out for that and then august 30th is a big day for some causes and some charities that I want to let you know about. Uh, I will be at Zane Bash during the day. Zane Bash put on by John Duggan, who you can hear about his story and why he started Zane Bash on episode two of this podcast. So I highly encourage you to listen to that podcast and realize how big of a deal and how important Zane Bash is for the community of Charlotte and for John and people who have gone through the things that he's gone through and helping people and, and gratitude through through giving and stuff like that. And also, too, I'm also doing a wonderful show later on the night with a cause, Comedy for a Cause of the Charlotte Comedy Zone. That's also that Sunday night, August 30th. A lot of really funny people. Probably very good lineup that Chris James has put together. And Chris James himself is probably one of the funnier guys in Charlotte. So please come out for that. It's a wonderful cause. I think it's NC Equality is what we're, we're supporting on that show. So make sure you come out for that. The Charlotte Comedy Zone, Comedy for a Cause. Anyways, if you want to know more about where I'm out and how all these shows and things are going on in my life, make sure you follow me on social media. Uh, on Twitter, at Manscout Manning. On Instagram, at Manscout Manning. If you have a question about the podcast, make sure you email me at jake at sslshow.com. Or if you want to book me for an upcoming wrestling event, make sure you email me at manscoutmanning at yahoo.com. Anyways, without further ado, let's jump into this wonderful podcast with the mayor of Charlotte, Mr. Mayor himself, Dan Klotfelter, here on Stranger in a Southern Land. Anyways, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for sitting down with me today and having a conversation. I know it's a busy day here at the office. Every day so. is a busy day, but glad to, glad to make time for this. <laughs> well, thank you. I actually, uh, I saw you yesterday at the at the Charlotte Pride Parade, and I was I was going to wave to you. I was like, hey, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to see you tomorrow, <laughs> yeah. but I figured that would have been weird. So. <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's great. Well, a lot of folks on the street yesterday. I think it was a, a big success. Yeah, yeah, wonderful turnout and yeah. stuff like that. But, uh, um, you know... I, in doing research for this this podcast, I see that you're a very well educated man, is very well traveled in, in a sense. Well schooled, I'm not sure how well educated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well we'll we'll go we'll go that route. Okay, yeah. But uh, you know, I noticed you, you were you were born in Thomasville, North Ca- North Carolina, right? And then you made you went to school in Oxford, England, right. at Oxford University, right. and knowing what I know about like. The fact that, like, if somebody from Thomasville, North Carolina, went to Oxford now, it probably wouldn't be too much of a culture shock. But somebody from Thomasville, North Carolina, in the '60s and '70s, it's a big culture shock. Going to, you know, talk about that. Like, well, I'd never been out of the country before. Yeah, Um, hadn't really traveled very much outside North Carolina before, and so uh, uh, getting on a plane and flying over the ocean and. uh, 
uh, landing in a place where they said they spoke English. I, you couldn't prove it by me, but they said they spoke English. It was a, you know, a little bit of an adjustment. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, um, I wasn't used to uh, the dreariness of the weather, and it took a long time to get used to it. Yeah, especially but, the sunny oh, yeah. North Carolina. Absolutely. Temperate Absolutely. winters. But it was just a heartbreakingly beautiful place. I mean, when when things were green and in the spring and in the summer, it was just absolutely gorgeous and just, uh, you know, I fell in love with it. Yeah. And like I said, and then you, you moved on and you went to, to Yale as right. far as law and stuff right. like that. What was the thing that interested you about law? Um, just always had thought I might be a lawyer growing up. Um, um, I had, there was a, a very prominent, uh, local lawyer in the County there, uh, who, um, provided a really good role model. And, and I watched him and thought, well, you know, I like what he does. I like, like, like the kinds of things that I see him doing. And, um, he was pretty active in civic affairs, uh, in the County. Um, and I was, uh, um, ended up doing a lot of public speaking in high school. Uh, I was, uh, in high school, uh, public speaking and debate and was pretty good at it. So I thought, well, you know, that's a skill that maybe I can turn it into something. Was there anything else, like anything side other than just no, that? Just like no, there it? were no lawyers in my family. I didn't have any, um, you know, lawyers uh, in the family or anything like that. Okay. And then and you moved on in, into actually practicing yeah, law and doing right. your own practice and right. stuff like that, right. you know. And, and what type of law did you practice? Well, I've done a variety of things. Sometimes uh, my law partners wonder exactly what I do. But, I mean, I do <laughs> I do really sort of um, odd, odd things, uh, odd cases from time to time that uh, doesn't seem to fit a, a standard pattern. Um, uh, one of the cases I'm, I'm working on right now that I'm having a lot of uh, 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 involvement with is um, I'm, I'm representing the city of Asheville, and we're suing the state of North Carolina to try to block the a law that the General Assembly passed to take Asheville's water and sewer system away from Asheville and give it to a separate a separate authority. So it it's a constitutional case. It's about whether they have the constitutional power to do that. So not a common case, not a typical kind of case. I like doing things like that. Okay, so it's, so that's kind of where the, the public service and politics yeah. kind of meets. They sort of meet together. Yeah, they yeah. meet together. So they yeah. do. And 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 where did the idea of of getting involved in public service come from? Uh, again, I don't I don't uh, have a there wasn't a, a sort of a single moment or anything. It just seemed to be again something that uh, I was good at. Uh, I enjoyed uh, sort of um, being part of a group and trying to work through a, a project or, uh, you know, in school put on a project or, or be part of a team on that. And um, it, it, it just, I got a lot of satisfaction out of doing that. So um, I was in student government in, in, in college and just always thought it might be something I was very interested in. I worked on, um, first thing I ever did politically was I passed out flyers when I was 10 years old for uh, Governor Terry Sanford. He was running for governor. And, then, and how'd uh, you get involved with that? Well, I don't know. Somebody just asked me to pass out some flyers, and so I passed out some flyers. And you're like uh, a kid. That sounds like, like fun. Like a kid. Yeah, yeah. that's fun. Let's do like this. Yeah. Let's do this. And you sort of want to figure out what's going on, and so uh, uh, you know, one thing led to another. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah. like, what was the what was your first post? What was the first assignment for you politically? What was the first thing you ran for? Uh, in, in as an adult, the first thing I ran for was uh, Charlotte City Council, and, okay. in uh, in 1987, and. Um, Ran out of a district, uh, District One, and uh, was successful. Uh, had a, uh, it was a, it was a con- crowded race. It was an open seat. The incumbent was retiring, and there were five of us. And and uh, which was the best time to run when the incumbent leaves? That, that's right. You never want to run against the incumbent. Well, you you know, it's better not to. Yeah. It's it's easier <laughs> not to. And so there were five of us, and I threw my hat in the ring and, and was elected. So okay. uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, uh, the city at that time was about mm, three hundred thousand people. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's over 800,000 today. So it's a very, very different kind of place. So. But what, what would you say other than just size was like the main thing that was different about it? Well, it was still a much more uh, traditional southern city. Uh, the population was mostly uh, white and black. Uh, there were very few uh, immigrants in the community, very few f- people from outside of North Carolina or people who hadn't grown up in one of the surrounding states. There weren't a lot of folks from the West Coast or from the Northeast or from overseas in Charlotte. That's probably the biggest single difference, I would say. The and biggest it, and what sparked that change, you think? Um, you know, no. again, it's no one thing that sparked it. Um, mm-hmm. This was uh, 
uh, a very vibrant economy, uh, lots of opportunity here for people. So you started attracting talented people. The, the banks were a big part of that. They, they got a lot of that started. They brought folks in from the Northeast and from the West Coast. And uh, they were people uh, who moved to Charlotte who were used to a much more diverse uh, environment. And so they began to tell friends and neighbors, and the word began to filter out, and uh, eventually it spread even outside the United States. So um, today, uh, we've got almost almost 18% of our population was born outside the United States originally. Uh, uh -huh. You know, was born somewhere else. Yeah, and it, like I said, it's just even like even just hard finding something from Charlotte, and you know now a growing community outside of just even this continent. Yeah. You know? Although I have two kids who uh, this is their hometown. They were born and grew up here. So. so oh, so uh, they're the, there are a few. The, there's a two unicorns running around the, this the, town. No, <laughs> I think I think there's going to be more and more of those in the future. Yeah, uh, I th there's a lot of people settling here. There's a lot yeah. of the Midwest people that really prefer yeah. it here. Like yeah. I originally am from Iowa. Yeah. I know a lot of people from Indiana, Ohio, just yeah. because it's not. In, as cold as Indiana <laughs> and Ohio, you know, yeah, so there, yeah. there, there's that sense to it. That's true. That's true. Um, on your time at City Council, what were some of the things that you got, like accomplishments or things you were proud of or well, lessons was, you learned? In I was sense? really focused a lot on um, on uh, neighborhood development and um, building strong neighborhoods in the city. It was a time when the city was growing very, very rapidly. And there was a need to really focus on making sure we didn't lose the fabric of the existing neighborhoods we had and try to preserve them and, and keep them very, very strong. So uh, that was a, a time when a lot of initiatives that were started that today uh, you look out at neighborhoods like South End and like Noda, and uh, we were uh, in the very beginning stages of trying to make sure those neighborhoods just didn't slide off into you know, be destroyed or bulldozed. Mm -hmm. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, those were when we uh, started the seeds of what became those neighborhoods today. Other neighborhoods around the city, very similar. So, you know, it's been great to watch watch that success and, and watch uh, watch the, those neighborhoods grow and thrive. Yeah, but we still have now challenge today, the challenges with other neighborhoods is, uh, they go through a life cycle. You know, they age. The people who originally built the homes or, or, or started the neighborhoods or started the businesses in the neighborhoods, and, you know, they'll retire or they'll move uh, or they'll sell their businesses, and you go through transition. So it's, um, it's a constant thing. Yeah, and, and, and how does politics kind of curve that, like, or help that transition? Like, what are the things that it Well, does? I mean, in so many ways. I mean, they're, they're just, they're, there's so many things you can do collectively if you work together with, um, um, and, and what government can do is help mobilize the other players in the community, can help mobilize the businesses in the neighborhood, can help uh, the residents sort of learn how to work together, to work with larger organizations and find resources and tap into resources. Um, that's, a, uh, that's a pretty powerful role. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, during your time at city council, you could have gone back to your law practice and probably, you know, have been very successful. What made you charge on even to like the state senate and more political? Well, I never gave up the law practice. So, I mean, well, I know that, uh, but like you could have just gone well, back. Well, and, and, and I did. did. Um, so, in 1993, I didn't run for re-election mm -hmm. and uh, spent about six years um, working full time uh, law practice, but some other volunteer things. Did a lot of uh, other volunteer work uh, during that time, and uh, um, when uh, a friend. Uh, who was in the state Senate, she decided not to run for re-election. She came to see me and said, you know, why don't you run for my seat? And we were longtime friends, and she told me about it. We talked about it, and I thought, yeah, you know, I could do some good down, down in the state capitol. Um, I've been a North Carolinian all my life, and I wanted to sort of see, well, okay, can you, can you try to help, help work on issues at the state level? Well, what type of good did you want to do, or what was your what was your thought process? Well, like, what um, can I do? How can I? I mean, a lot of the things I was uh, focused on uh, were about uh, urban policy in the state, and uh, how could the state be uh, more supportive of the growth of, of cities? I mean, this is a state whose history uh, has not been an urban history. It's been one of the least urbanized states uh, in the United States up until very very recently, and it's only very recently that we've had cities like like Charlotte and like Raleigh. Uh, that have become large by national standards. Never was true in m my time growing up. Uh, this was just not a state of cities. So I wanted to work on that issue down in the legislature. And, and now, how do you do that? Like, like, what, how do you do that politically? Well, I mean, uh, you, you, first you have to sort of uh, uh, persuade your colleagues that it's good for them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good for them as well as for you and for your folks back home. Uh, what I found with it were, was that people in the legislature were very receptive to the idea. Even even folks from uh, from rural parts of the state uh, would would sort of understand the value 
of a strong economy in Charlotte because that would support an awful lot of things that the state was doing in their communities. Uh, Charlotte would generate a lot of economic wealth that could then be used to help um, with poorer schools in rural areas. And, and so they were supportive. Yeah. Okay. So, so during your time in the state Senate, and that came to an end, but what yeah. brought you back to Charlotte and civic politics? Well, um, it's, a, it's a harsh place. Uh, the legislature is a harsh place unless you're in the majority party. Ah. And so uh, I ended up after 2010 being in the minority party, and there just wasn't as much to do. Uh, there was very little I could contribute uh, as a member of the minority party. And so um, there was a need here, um, not something that I'd been planning, uh, but when – uh, we had that unfortunate event happen. Um, there was a need here, and I thought, you know, I can still do some good work. Um, uh, I, I understand some of the challenges that are going on in the city. Uh, it's time to come home and uh, do some work here. Hey, so. well, what were those challenges? What, what do you think your, what are your major, major obstacles? Well, I mean, again, right part, of, part, of, uh, part of it is we've, we've talked about a little bit already, and that is just the sheer explosion of the city in terms of size but also in terms of diversity. And to keep the city uh, sort of um, – having a common sense of itself and a common direction and making everybody feel like they're included and that they're part of what's going on in the city. Uh, that's the biggest challenge for a fast growing city uh, like Charlotte. I mean, if we were a stable city or a declining city, you know, that wouldn't be as big a challenge. But when you've got so many people moving here from so many different places, bringing so many different backgrounds, then uh, getting them all together on the same team and going in the same direction is, is an important challenge. I think we're doing a, a, a pretty good job of it. Mm -hmm. I think we're doing a pretty good job of it. Yeah, I mean, the growth is definitely very visible, but yeah. the skyline, right. just in the 10 years that I've been here, yeah. you know, I'm one of those people that I was only supposed to be here for three months, three-month <laughs> internship, and then uh, now I've been here for 10 years. Yeah. And in that time, I've seen like just even the growth of South End. Yes. Down, down the light rail, and right. what, you know, just getting that going, the light rail, and the, and the growth from there. You know, there's a lot of things that politically that could be done in, in planning. And you're part of the – now, I'm guessing the planning the commission of the city was – a big part of like well i was on the planning commission before i was on the city council okay. and so that that was another thing that stimulated my interest in uh, in those kind of growth issues and, and neighborhood issues but we got plenty of opportunities like south end uh elsewhere in the city and i think that's one of the exciting things right now again i remember south end when it was a collection of abandoned uh, industrial warehouses and which very, wasn't that long ago <laughs> very few people were living there yeah. well we've got opportunities like that for example, in the Graham Street and Statesville Road, North Tryon Corridor, we've got the uh, what we call the Applied Innovation Corridor. There's an opportunity there, just like there was in South End. And so it's really exciting to think about those things. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, a lot of, there's a lot of neighborhoods that are in transition and potential. But Correct. What, what are some areas that you think uh, you, you foresee some future problems that need to be addressed in the upcoming Well, years? Uh, the biggest challenge we've got, again, is that we have um, uh, some folks who are just sort of stalled. Um, that they, they're really not able to, to share or participate in the economic success of the city. And uh, you, you're familiar, I'm sure, with the studies that rank us very low, if not last, um, very near the last, in terms of our ability of some of our people to move up the economic ladder, to find good jobs and to find stable careers and be able to support their families. That's the big challenge right now. We can't, we can't be successful if we've got a portion of our population that's just permanently left behind. So uh, I think that's really where we have to focus a lot of attention now. Right. Na neighborhoods and, and, and people who are left behind, um, then the whole city is, is diminished from that. Uh, you know, it's, it's like going out on the field with not all of your team members. You know, mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you've got people who are locked out, it's like fielding less than a full team for the game, and we can't have that. Yeah, and, and, and how are – how does your job like how do you affect that like how, how do you do that well in a lot of ways i mean the mayor doesn't have a lot of formal powers i yeah, can't but i like, can't you know direct yeah. somebody to do something or, or well, write a check to spend money but but what you can do is be a cheerleader a spokesperson and and you can encourage them to sort of think about things you can plant ideas you can convene folks to talk to each other uh, and stimulate uh, the work of others around you um, I, I think that's very satisfying i enjoy that mm -hmm. i enjoy that yeah and um you know, you you were part of uh, you know the city council and commission and other right. like that, and of course you became mayor on, right. on some very unique circumstances, nonetheless. I hope they're unique. I hope unique means one of a kind, never repeated again. I hope that's the case. Yes. Yeah. Uh, were you up for the task to become mayor? Or did you ever think that was something that you were ever going to do or I wanted didn't to do? I Think it was something I would ever do? No. Um, I, I really didn't think it was something I would ever do. But there it was, and it just seemed. Um, it just 
you have to do something. I felt compelled to sort of say, we can't have this be the way things go. We can't have this be the way people think about us. Mm -hmm. This is not who we are. And um, I com committed my whole public service career to a, a Charlotte that's not represented by what happened that day. And so I got to do something about it. Um, I didn't know whether I'd be any good at the job or not, but I, I decided to, to try it out. And uh, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, and like, like I said, like you, you that's a very unique set of circumstances. Yeah, very. And and like one thing that I that I find unique about that whole situation, uh, you know, our mayor, everything that happened with him is the the city never became a punchline. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like this could have been a very big punchline of right. the city, and, and there, there's a good read because there's such you know polarization as far as like politically and everything like that, right. and everybody likes to really give it to politicians, especially now nowadays. Right. And we really could have had a distrust and, and all kinds of awful things that happened, but I don't think that's the case anymore. And w did you see that as a conscious effort on your part to make sure that happens? It was, it was, I think the reason I was chosen for the job was to try to, um, come in and, and calm the waters and model, uh, to the world who we really were so that we didn't become a punchline. Uh, and I, I felt like my job was to say, Hey, uh, I, I, I'm the way Charlotte is. This is who we are. Uh, I, I stand for what Charlotte stands for. And um, I think by and large that, 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 that worked. I think it worked. Uh, we are not the punchline any, anymore, if we ever were. I don't know. Um, in, in prep for the, this interview, I yeah. listened to, I believe, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the speech, but it's, it's online on your website. It was something that you gave the city council. It was like almost like a dress of this city yeah. that you gave at the end of the right. year. And one of the probably the most statistics, biggest things that you said in there, other than what you're saying about the, the lack of growth, was also the, the lack of crime, that our crime numbers have gone down considerably, right. like in, to like, I think like 20 years or 25 years, right. the lowest in however long right and i th thought that was kind of shocking I was like how bad was it here 20 years ago <laughs> if that's the case <laughs> because like every time you turn on the news you see you know more uh issues between cops and 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 the, and the communities and stuff like that what do you think is the thing that's kind of prevent charlotte from being not being one of those cities well uh, i have to give a lot of credit to the former police chief um, monroe and now to his successor chief putney both of them have a, a very intentional uh, uh, approach to connecting the officers in the community with the residents of the community so that the police become not some outside group that swoops in and, and tackles the bad guys, but they become part of the community. They're around, they're seen, they engage with the community, they participate in community events, people get to know them, people then trust them. And, and when, when the police and the citizens trust each other, uh, that, is, that is a great recipe for, for keeping down crime. It means people are more willing to report things, they're more willing to share information, uh, and, and there's just a, a better flow of communication between the department and, and the citizenry. That's a big part of it. It's a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. And Chief Monroe and Chief Putney have been stars at doing that. We've talked about a lot, of, a lot of good things that have happened and, and things that you are you're focused on. But what are some other things that you're focused on um, coming into this? Uh, like we're coming into an election season right, right now, and you know you've got a lot of things that you've you've got you want to continue to do because obviously we're kind of on a roll. We have got things going here. What are things you want to continue to do and continue to work on if you are you know elected mayor? Well, the biggest one, as I, I've said earlier already, is is the challenge of uh, unlocking doors for economic opportunity for folks who right now don't have it in Charlotte. And that, that is a multi-pronged uh, issue. It's not, there's not one silver bullet for that. There's not one thing you do about that. That requires mobilizing resources in the private sector, in the nonprofit sector, and the government sector. That's got to be top priority. Uh, one thing, though, I haven't said anything about it, so I need to, is we're also facing some very stiff financial challenges in the city. Uh, because of actions taken by the state legislature over the last couple of years that have severely uh, impacted the state of uh, the city's budget and when well, we're what specific well I mean they've repealed tax taxing authority uh, they're currently ta talking about taking away our local sales tax and giving it to others in the state uh, sales uh, in made in Mecklenburg County where you pay sales tax here at the store in Mecklenburg County they want to take the tax revenue and send it somewhere else and not let us keep it here Mm -hmm. uh, give it to somebody else uh, other than where the sale occurred. 
Well, that could severely cramp our ability to build out the infrastructure we need. That's the biggest impact we're going to see. A fast-growing city, we need to, uh, we have a huge capital uh, budget that we have to fund, things like new police stations, new fire stations to keep up with the growth, build out of our transit system after we finish the Blue Line uh, extension, uh, continue to uh, work on our transportation network. Um, uh, uh, and, and if the state legislature is going to take away our, our local revenues, we, we've got a real challenge. We've got a real challenge. Mm -hmm. So uh, I spend a, a good bit of time worrying about that. I spend a good bit of time pleading with my former colleagues about that and talking with them about um, uh, well, how damaging well, their actions are. What you're saying makes sense, but what's yeah. their rationale behind it? Well, um, there seems now to be a, a different attitude about the urban and, and rural issues than there was when I was in the legislature. Uh, and it's much more, uh, there's an anti-urban uh, move in the legislature right now that we haven't seen before. Well, why, why would that, I, I don't know uh, why that would make sense. I, I, I don't think it does make sense. Uh, so I can't give you the rationale for okay. it because I don't think it makes You're sense. You're not on that side of the argument. I'm so not you on can't that side of the it. argument, so I can't explain it. I do know, I do know that there are areas of, of, of rural North Carolina that are experiencing the same kind of economic distress that we have uh, pockets of in our city. And uh, right now, uh, frankly, I don't think the state is addressing that very effectively. But the solution is not to take money from fast growing urban areas that need it to support infrastructure uh, and, and shipping it off to rural counties. That's not gonna solve their economic problems. It just won't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, all it will do is make everybody worse off. Yeah. Uh, that's not a good recipe. Absolutely. Great. But um, anyways, what made you want, I mean, you were you're the mayor, you, you stepped in, you made a change, but what made you want to run for, for re-election? Um, I decided I wasn't done yet. Uh, I still had uh, some things in me that needed to, uh, to, to get out. And one of those was to sort of uh, get this issue of how we're going to finance our long-term growth in the city. That's, that's a really key issue. It has been an issue I've worked on for my whole career. Uh, I wanted to spend another couple of years working on that before I hang up my hat. Yeah, and, and you've actually you get, you get four other you get three other candidates running against you right, right. now. Right, in, in the primary, There's, in the primary, uh, there are six of us in the Democratic primary and two in the Republican primary. Okay, what what do you think differentiates you from all the other candidates, other than you being the incumbent mayor? Obviously. <laughs> Well, I, I, I do think I have a, a much more comprehensive vision of what's happening in the city and how all the pieces work together uh, and, and where are the challenges, and, but also where are the opportunities and how can we connect, uh, connect the opportunities to the challenges in a way that solves our problems. I think I have a much more comprehensive view of what, how the city functions and what the city really needs to move forward. Mm -hmm. Well, as we kind of get closer, because I know you have a busy day, yeah. and I have a busy day as well, you yeah. know, strong mustache men, we, 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 we stay very busy. <laughs> is, is there anything before we jump off here that you want, want to say or let people know about Charlotte and kind of the struggles and what you, you want to do as mayor upcoming in the future if you're elected? Well, um, what I would say is uh, this is a great city. It, 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 this is a, a really vibrant city. It's a very resilient city. And the challenges that we've talked about in the course of the discussion here are, are really challenges of success. Uh, we're, we're not in a period of decline. So when we think about the, the problems and the things we need to tackle in this city, we need to realize that we're, uh, we're, we're dealing with issues that only successful cities are dealing with. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Well, how can people get in, in touch with you as far as like Twitter, f so, social uh, media, and also to like uh, support your campaign? Contact the mayor's office uh, uh, for any information about city services. Now, that's not about supporting the campaign, you understand. But either either but, way. But, but uh, if, if they're interested in, in things that are going on in the city uh, or the activities or what the city's involved in or what we're doing in the mayor's office, uh, they can find us on, on uh, the mayor's office online, www.charmac.org. Uh, they can find out all, about a whole range of things that the city is involved in and, and, and they're going on. That's not, again, campaign related. Yeah. Though. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, I just want to, so want to give all those opportunities to yeah. let people know what you, what you got going on. You so, bet. Anyways, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day Great today. To do it, Jake. And, and I appreciate I, it. I appreciate you. So, thank, thank you. you. You bet. Take care. Yeah.